The improvisational force. Delve. Delve into heart of place, time, culture, human emotion, memory to excavate and reveal. Delve into the heart of places, of times, geographies, cultures, memories, dreams, wishes, places, distinct, authentic dreams and cultures of identity. Exploration, excavation, revelation, the unique aspects within distinct human dreams, cultures, times, travels. Black Portlanders is an exploration. It's an adventure. It's a dance. It's photography. It's word. It's body. It's mind. It's travel. And this is improv. I'm making this up right now. I have it in my head and I'm pulling it out of my body and I'm giving it to you. And I guess for the next hmm, 30 to 45 minutes, it's gonna hit each of you in different ways and that's the whole point. So I started the Black Portlanders in February 2013. I had talk with my sisters. Um, my sisters are also artists. Um, we were just curious or needed to know who and what and when uh, black people in Portland are, were, when, could be, will be, might be, should be. I don't know. Um, and I was, you know, I grew up dancing and writing and photographing and thinking and I stuttered as a child. Um, I stuttered as a child, so my world was in books. Um, I started stuttering in the first grade, and I couldn't really talk to people. Um, so where I found my place was in stories, and stories of adventure, stories of people going places and discovering something, some quest or some heart's true desire. And uh, that was what I did. I read on the playground. I didn't really have a lot of friends as a kid. Well, when do I have friends? I had my sisters, but you know, and I had a few other people, but I'm being honest. Like, I didn't, um, I really couldn't communicate with others that well. So, where I found my place was in the realm of story, in the realm of the words of others and authors and imagination and dreams and all the things you can get from books, all the things, all the emotions, the periods, the voices, everything of a human life of an animal life, of a universe, of a world, of imagination, of time travel, of shooting forth, of shooting back, of being in your body and not being in your body at the same time. Um, so my life began to be about the quest, about the adventure, about finding a reason to do something, to get out, to use yourself, um, I have this quote, I have, I have several quotes today. Oh yeah, so these are these pictures that I've taken over, <laughs> over the past year. And they're all different people from all different places around Portland. This is on Sandy by the Hollywood Theater. And I'll probably just look up and, yeah, this is that guy. He's from Magic Mouth. I love this band. I think they're playing here soon. 
Um, so I, yeah, like, I ran into him on the bus on like Cesar Chavez. And I ran into this guy on like at uh, Pioneer Square at the Roots Festival. Um, it's interactions. I'm, I'm just gonna talk off the top of my head. <laughs> it's interactions. Like this is over here by Pioneer Square. I talked to this lady maybe in December. This guy is named, I think his name is Kendall. And I met him over by the Ace Hotel. Um, and back to this quote. Ooh, a couple of quotes. One, this quote by Bill T. Jones, who I love. I've come to think that if everything goes really well in this life, or we're really good, or we're really lucky, we will get to tell all the stories. We will get to play all the parts. And this quote from Muriel Rukeyser, I hope I'm saying her last name right. <sighs> Let's see here. I love this poem. It's called Night Flight. I'm just going to read the last part. Or perhaps I'll read the first part and skip to the last part. Believe that we bloom upon this stalk of time. And in this expansion, time too grows for us, richer and richer towards infinity. Can I sit on this? <laughs> Believe that your presences are strong. Oh, be convinced without formula or rhyme or any dogma. Use yourselves. Be fly. Believe that we bloom upon this stalk of time. So a lot of people are really asking me, why am I doing this? So this is Afangi. He works at OPB. He's cool. This is a man I met on Hawthorne. Um, I can't think of the intersection. Also a man on Hawthorne. A lot of people have asked me why I'm doing this project over the course of the past year. And I've been hesitant to say why. Um, I don't want to say why. Um, I don't want to give a reason why. Um, I want people to find out for themselves. Uh, I think it's about sparking a thing. It's about sparking feeling and emotion and questions and curiosity. It's about, I don't think you have to have a reason to celebrate anyone or to make space for anyone or to do anything. Um, this, this lady came from New York. This lady, I met her on Mississippi on Valentine's Day. Um, and I'm cycling through my thoughts right now, but basically, I don't think you have to have a reason to celebrate people. And I guess we know the history of black people in this culture, in this geography, in this world, largely. And so many times we have been, or at least in the last, in the last couple of hundred years, because obviously black people had many more stories before this time. This guy was on 122nd and Burnside. He was really attractive. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, what was I saying? <laughs> we don't have to have a reason to explain ourselves. And each of these people has their own stories. This is only a blip. This is only one, one fraction of a second of these people's lives. And I, I do do the captions, but just that we are in a melange, we're in layers and layers of time and memory. And this guy, this guy met him like a week ago on, oh man, over there by Sizzle Pie. And he told me, what did he tell me? He told me that he was adopted, and I think when he was 14, uh, from Liberia, and that he wants to go back to find his roots. And this guy, this guy met at Sizzle Pie, and he started talking to me, and you know, I'm pretty good at telling if someone is of African descent. 
And some people, um, you can't tell because obviously we are a mixture here in this region of the world. Uh, but I'm pretty good, and I also do think about I also do think about the the fact that I might miss people. Uh, it's so many details. A story is an excavation, and to me, if we're thinking about navigating the real, that's what it is. Um, we think about if we think about a story, if we think about a fairy tale, if we think about a fantasy, if we think about a made up thing. If we think about reality, if we think about wanting to alter something, if we think about our hands, and if I think about you, if I think about you with your beautiful hair, and I think about this fellow here, and this guy here with these black shoes on, and these black socks, and black pants, and I sit by this lady. I've never met her before. Her name is Sarah Grace McKenless. She's from Gross Point, Michigan, mm -hmm. and she's a real person. I've never seen her before in the whole wide world, but here she is. <laughs> Where'd she come from? Was she a fantasy? Was she a story before I was here? Was she like real, or did she come out of my mind, or did she come out of somebody else's mind? Or I guess maybe she came out of her parents' minds. <laughs> oh, and this red thing here, and this, oh, this red thing here, and somebody made this with their thought, and here I am, and I'm trying to echo my voice up here and climbing over this guy and <laughs> I'm swooping over here and oh I don't want to well let's see here okay and I'm gonna like climb over this fellow and move over here oh, sorry I don't mean to hurt you and what's real what's real here thanks you're real I want to think about making real things with real stories and real people and real dreams and real dreams and real feelings and real wishes and real needs, real questions and real hurts, real gladnesses and true love. I want to navigate a world. I want to navigate a world with my feeling, not based exactly upon what exactly I see around me. I want to be a real person. I want to write my own hands. I want to stand on my own toes and my own feet. I want to celebrate all of our bodies. And it's this doorway. Let me check the time. It's this doorway. It's this doorway. I thought recently that there's this thing where sometimes we don't know if we're really real or not. I don't know if anybody else has felt that. Like you have all these things inside of you, you don't know if anybody else in the whole world has ever experienced them, and you're afraid to like let everything out of you, and you don't know if somebody's gonna like it, or somebody you have a crush on is gonna like you, or you don't know any of these things, and, and, there's, and there isn't anyone who's ever been like you ever before. There's this whole wide world, and there's stories that have been told about people in real life, the histories of how we got here, and what our emotions were, and what bodies were allowed to be where and when, at what time, and for whom. What I'm trying to say is there's a veil, a liminal place, a liminal place where we think we're told who we are by exactly what we see around us. And have you ever wanted to have a real adventure? Have you ever really wanted to like have a real adventure, not just, not just what you see around you? Have you ever wanted to have a real adventure and be a real story, be a real person, be a real boy, a real man, or a real woman, or a real, um, you know, forget those gender things, any of those, forget all of those things. Have you ever wanted to be real and like reach into life, reach past Every physical thing, every known thing, every last thing, every first thing, reach past that to actually craft the geography of life, to actually craft the geography of your body, to actually craft this landscape and reach with what's inside of you or out of you into some kind of future, into some kind of future or some kind of past. And if we're thinking about heritage, because we are thinking about heritage, a heritage, a heritage is a, 
is a collaboration, really. It's a collaboration between who you are now, right now in this moment, in this place. It's a collaboration between this second and that second and that second. That was just a second ago when I said that second was that second ago, a second ago. That second, a collaboration, a collaboration between you and me, a collaboration between, between the people who were standing over there about 50 or 40 or 20 or 200 or 300 or 500 years ago. A collaboration right now, this is an art project right now. This is an art project right here, right now. This is a life project. This is a land project. This is, a, this is a really a project. It's not a project. I guess we're right here. This heritage is a collaboration. And it's a collaboration. And I think there's a fear sometimes that we're not really real and that we can't really alter life and that it's so big and that's not true. That's not true. We, I'm a story, I'm a book, I am a pen with my fingers and I'm a pen and I am grasping life. And I guess as a dancer and also as a photographer, it's all about seconds and you're improving. And as I'm out on the street and as I'm out there and I'm listening and I'm seeing and I'm looking and I'm hearing, it's all a dance. And I have to listen so hard to my feelings. I have to use my intuition. And I'm really just talking to strangers. This guy, this guy I talked to last week, his name is Earl. He told me he was the Earl of Portland. And he told me, <laughs> He told me, he told me that he was, he was a part of a big, a big, a big family of black people here. Sometimes I have this thing where I'll be writing something and I'll be so intense with it. And I, I send a lot of emails to people and sometimes when I write things I get teary eyed. And I feel like in that moment of like capsizing feeling I could, um, I, I could live my life in like one second, like one concentrated drop of life that I could just travel so far. And that's what I do. Um, I travel so far. And I'm able to, sometimes I feel like I could have already died already. And sometimes by thinking that I've already died, I'm able to leave my body and be more than what I think that I am. I guess the gist of what I'm trying to say is that we're time travelers, really. And that what we do in this moment, the art that we create with each other, with the past and with the future, that's, a, that's his art project. That, that's the art project. And now I will leave this moment and press escape. <laughs> a story can be any form of anything. We start out walking, we start out writing stories on the earth with, I'm getting used to this mouse, with our feet. We start listening, we start talking. And now in this age, we have so many ways to transpose a feeling, a story, a method, a means. Stories, it's just, it's just everything. Um, and so, yeah, so about a year and some months ago, I started this way of, finding people in real life. And I put it online. And I posted it on Facebook. And I guess some people saw it. And friends saw it. And then other people saw it. And then people started posting, oh, this is so great. Oh, we need this. A story, ooh, this is the other thing. A story is, a, is, 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 is one of the Few things on the earth that the more you share with others, it's not like a pie, like you cut it up and everyone has little. Um, the more you share it, the more that it is. What these, what these images are, they're images. They are technically images. They come through a camera, through this lens here. They, they come through there and that's where I look through there and I see people and but there's a lot of science behind it. Of course, I didn't build this camera. I don't know everything. But what I do know is it's spirit. That's what's shared more than anything. Um, these are all photographs. But it's a, it's a visual map. It's a visual atlas. Um, crafting a map of images 
to people. There's this thing, the way I think about the Black Portlanders, it's like technically photographed, it's technically a photo essay, um, it's technically a transmuted project, it's technically all these things. But the way I think about it is a cultural incubator. Um, it's an incubator just like a, just like a startup incubator, all these things, but it's an incubator of feeling and spirit. And I love what I do so much. I love talking to these people. I love, I love it. Sometimes when I finish, when I finish photographing someone, I just leave and I just have these chills. And depending upon who it is, sometimes I just almost cry because people are so beautiful. And I would never abandon that. We are so complex. But I think there's this thing about dreams and wishes that inside of us there's, ooh, ooh, ooh. Uh, There's this thing about dreams and wishes, about possibility, about who we are with always that's never changed. And these, these, I, I met these, um, the, uh, these family members, um, maybe it was on Eastman Parkway in Gresham, and like, and this is, these are his grandchildren, they were so beautiful. They were so beautiful. And he told me, he said, these are my grandchildren, I'm so proud of them. And it was so loving and so rich. And there's so much information here of so much. There's just, look at her little teeth. <laughs> and look at his little grandpa face, like a little, <laughs> little Santa, or just these wrinkles. And they all have the same teeth. And <laughs> it's just so much. It's just so much beauty. They are African, of African descent. They are of Native American heritage. Um, and they're here in the Portland metro area. And family, this is Ural Thomas of Ural Thomas and the Paint. Um, he is, I interviewed him, uh, like I actually interviewed him. Um, and he's, I think he said he was from Arkansas. He, he's been here since he was like, four or five or six and he came up on a train and he told me all these things he told me that i'm checking the time he told me that i think they came up on on trains on trains and they came up with other families and like he said that all the families that they came that came up they all became family they all took care of each other over the years and he lives in the mississippi area and he's been there and he told me about when, he told me about the selling of the houses and all these things. And he's still there and he has his, his yard, it's like this beautiful junkyard garden. But not junk, but like, it's just so different. You know, it's like that, I don't know if you guys have heard of that, that, that children's book, The Big Orange Splotch. Anyone? Okay, well, yeah, somebody. Um, He's awesome. You should check him out. He's amazing. Uh, um, yeah, her name is, is Reagan Fikes. And um, her name is, oh, it's like Mariah, but it's Mar Maria. Or it's, it's an M name. I have it on me, but I have to think. Um, and this is a lady. I can't remember her name, but she's also from Portland. Um, that's Ural when he was a young man in Portland, soul scene. Um, I met this man on, on um, yellow, on Mississippi. Wait, no, not Mississippi, William Street. And he was a, he was a firefighter and a, a veteran. Um, and this guy, he goes to he goes to PSU, and he's studying journalism. He, he, he did an interview with me. Um, I met this lady um, by Pioneer Square. Um, but yeah, I was trying to get to the beginning, but yeah, so many stories, um, so many stories. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I put it on Facebook, and I put it on Tumblr, and I put it on, I put it on Twitter as well, though. Um, I don't think a lot of people super know that I'm on Twitter. But 
Um, it's about changing a landscape or geography through words and images and feeling. And that's, that, that's what I like. This one. Okay. So um, before I came to Portland, I was in Memphis. I'm from Memphis, Tennessee, which is a, a similarly sized city, but the flip side of Portland is in there is actually more black people there than, than um, yeah, there's actually a majority of black people there. And it's obviously a rich history with the civil rights movement and place and I feel like the South is, I feel like the feelings of a place get into the air. Like, it's like a vibrating thing. Like, the air in Memphis feels, and I, it's obviously hotter. <laughs> <laughs> it's obviously hotter, but there's something about like what happened, what happened there that's like vibrates it and like, makes everything intense and like there's a history of place and slavery and like civil rights movement and also people loving and living and doing all those things um, that I don't feel here. I don't feel that here. I feel other things here. Um, my mom is from, is from Greenville, Mississippi. Uh, she's a civil rights, civil rights lawyer and a writer. Uh, my dad is a arts educator and a, and a musician and a griot. So I grew up around a lot of black history and culture that it was important to know who you are and like where you're from and where, all those things, all those stories. And, um, and I left home when I was 17. I went to a boarding school in Vermont on a, form, on a farm. Then I, I think I was maybe one of six black people at this boarding school. And then I left and I went to Spelman College in Atlanta, which was the other side of the situation, you know, a, 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 um, a, a historical black college. And then I left and I went to Connecticut to Wesleyan University. And, and then, um, and I started this project about people of African descent. Before I started this project, it was called the People Could Fly Project. And it was based on a children's book um, by Virginia Hamilton. Actually, it's based on an African, no, on an, on a, um, it's based on an American, like South America and, and North America, this myth and folktale about the flying African, about people of African descent that were, that could fly. And they were brought to America, um, and over the Middle Passage, or over that process of being displaced, they lost their wings. Um, and they go through this period of slavery. And let me check the time. Um, and yeah, they go through this period of slavery. And, and then they remember themselves through words. And they fly again. And so I took that tale, I'm gonna go through this real fast. They, so I took that tale, the, the frame of that tale, and I started traveling around the states and to different places around the world to actually realize this folk tale that was told by people who were actually enslaved in America. So to take a tale and make it real. And I began to photograph and talk to and interview um, people of African descent around the United States and in Djibouti, in Jamaica, in Morocco, my sisters were also a part of it. They went to Egypt. And then I got out of school, and no, at, like, at that time I had flight privileges. My dad uh, worked for the airline, so I could pretty much fly anywhere in the States for free, and blah, blah, blah. So then, uh, then I got out of college, and I lost my flight privileges. <laughs> and that was rough. <laughs> That was rough. So in a way, it's like still embodying this tale, like, oh, I'm flying around, or I'm going to New York, I'm going this place, that, and I'm doing this project, and then suddenly I'm out of school, and then I, don't, I can't fly anymore. And I'm like, what am I going to do? And I'm kind of lost, and I don't know what's going on with my art, and I'm here in Portland. I moved here to Portland, and, and I'm a lost artist. And that happens. 
Uh, that really happens. You don't know where you are. You don't know what you're doing. Um, you don't know what you're doing. And you're in the desolate part of the story. You're in that part of the story where you don't have your wings. And you don't have what you thought you had. You don't have the gifts that you thought you had. And that happens too. It might happen to me again. You know? Um, I'm sure it happens all throughout life. But anyway, I was so gung-ho about traveling and talking to people of African descent around the world, and I was like, you know, like, uh, my father had, had gone, had, had, like, traveled and gone to Africa and all these things. But I thought on my, on my mother's side that I might have been, you know, that, 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 that my sisters and myself, that we might have been the first people in our family to, like, go back to Africa or something. And that's its own tale made real. And then, uh, I guess about maybe three years ago, I have a cousin who went to Emory, and she went to the library, and she saw this, like, it was like a scrapbook. And she was looking through the scrapbook, and then she was like, man, I think this is about my great-grandfather. And it was. It was about our great-grandfather. And he, um, he was from Mississippi, and he was a Baptist minister. And, and these, like, these, 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 these scrapbooks had been lost. They had been lost. Like, there, yeah, there's a scrapbook. Let me go back to this thing here. Do I press play? And so, alas, um, thinking about heritage and dreams, I also think we can inherit many things. We, in, we inherit our bodies and our toes and all these things, but I think we inherit stories and dreams. And you can't really see super well, but this is my grandfather, my great-grandfather in Egypt on my, on my mother's side. And he went all kinds of places. Um, yeah, he went to London and Israel and, and many places. And that's my, he was born in the late 1800s. And just to have a story emerge from time that you had no idea about, it infuses your bones with a whole other meaning that you are not lost in time. And I think that's the thing about black people here and in many places, and also people around the world, sometimes you think you're lost in time. You don't have a footing. You, you're, you're just adrift in the sea of the world. And to be able, ooh, let me go to the next one. Let me go to the next one. Um, yeah, I'm guessing. So this is my great-grandmother, uh, like Martha Gamble. And these are her siblings, and I think this is her father. And like, and I'm going to go to the next one. Yeah, this is my papa. Um, he was amazing. That's my grandmother, my mom, my father, my sister Minta, my sister Kalima, my sister Hanifa, and that's me. And that's not, uh, and that's also missing my other sister. That's my grandmother, Alversa Williams Lee. She got to the eighth grade, but she raised 14 children in Memphis. And they were all in the civil rights movement, and they had this title of the most arrested family in the civil rights movement. <laughs> and they were all there. They were all doing it. Um, those are my aunts. That's my grandmother's house. That's my papa as a young person. That's my papa. He's so handsome. And those are my sisters. Um, and that's my great grandfather. And that's me uh, when I was a sophomore. That's me when I was like a junior, oh, the places you'll go, Dr. Seuss, I believe in all those things. Uh, that's me in Djibouti with my sisters, making a project real. I just rambled on, but I just really want you guys to, I just really, the thing I want to share most of all is that, is that you're, the thing you are most passionate about is a real thing, that you are real, you are exciting, you are fabulous, you're important and beautiful and, and worthy of all things. And, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, that, that's what I like to share. Thank you so much for everything. Thanks for coming. Thanks for listening to me. Um, take care of your dreams for real. That's all we have in each other, you know, and stories.
Like, I'm not going to be in this body in 100 years, so I want to give all that I can, and I'm ready to give myself. Um, I'm ready to give myself. So thank you so much for listening and, and for everything. Yeah.